One of the tales we repeatedly tell in our family is a story about my son, Ethan, from when he was about two years old. And Ethan's speech developed a little slower than some other kids. And I think the TH is kind of tough, you know, to say in Ethan. And we don't know where this came from or why he did this, but for a good season, he called himself Edoba. <laughs> I believe that was spelled E-D-O dash B-A-H. We never confirmed, but Edoba. And so there was one afternoon, we were at the Tanglewood Lazy River, and he was just two, like I said, so I was on a float and he was on my lap and then my husband's on a float and um, my sister-in-law was there and it's time to get off. And unless you are incredibly athletic, <laughs> the dismount, the dismount from the float is sometimes tricky. It's, I don't know about for y'all, but for me, I feel it's rarely graceful, you know. And here I am, I'm going to have to, and, the, and you know, the river's still going and the people are piling up. It's very anxiety inducing in general. And um, I gotta get the two year old off of me and get me out and make sure the bathing suit's all, you know, the things. So, um, but my husband got out in front of me and he was prepared to, you know, lift Ethan and I am um, going to hoist him up. It's, you know, a little bit difficult. And just as you would strain and you would groan a little bit when you're exerting yourself, as I'm lifting him up, he says, Mama, Dada, Edoba. <laughs> Mama, Dada, Edoba. And we have giggled about that so much for obvious reasons. He brought dead weight to the situation. <laughs> he did no lifting, but he's communicating, I'm going for Mama, to dada, Edoba, Edoba. Here's what we're gonna revel in today. The Lord is your strength and he is your shield. He stands beside you, Jeremiah says, like a warrior and enemies cannot defeat you. So we're gonna take a look at Ephesians 6. I know we've um, talked about this passage um, briefly a couple of times, so we're going to really camp out there this morning. So if you have Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians 6, verse 10, or if not, follow along on the, on the screen. Here's what Paul says. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Every time we see the word stand, I want you all to say it out loud, okay? Just in case we see it again. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand. Therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So here's the question I want us to explore today. Why put on the full armor of God? Why? Why do we need it? What is this urgency that Paul's talking about? We're in a war. We are. We are very much in a spiritual battle, and we need the armor. I, I just love how he starts this whole section. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, or other versions say, in his mighty 
power. And I love how the message version states this. God is strong and he wants you strong. It's such a simple statement. But when I sat in that this week, it ministered to me deeply. God is strong and he wants you strong. So often worldly strength, particularly for women, I feel like, is defined by independence. You want to be a strong woman, don't need anyone. Don't find yourself needy. Financially, relationally, emotionally, make sure you're independent professionally. And, and that pressure makes me overwhelmed. And it makes me sad. And it makes me lonely. And that makes me anxious. Even the thought that for me to display strength means I have to exhibit independence. And I feel burdened for women of the world. That's what they're living under. That's all they know. They wake up to that weight every night, I mean every morning, and go to bed with that weight every night. So here's the first reason why we have to put on the full armor of God. Because strength is not mustered up. Strength is received. Paul says, strengthen yourself in the Lord. Strength is not mustered up. It's a gift that's received. So when the world would say, dig deep, get your stuff together, do life on your own, the Lord says to his people, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. That's a direct quote from Isaiah 30. In Isaiah 30, the people of God are freaking out. They're feeling fearful and insecure. And in the midst of feeling like their needs are, needs are not being met and they're not safe, they run to Egypt. And they're, they're seeking protection and safety from Egypt. And God says, no, 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 no. In returning and rest, I promise you'll be saved. Your strength is actually going to come from quietness and trust. And it's profound how the people respond right after that verse in Isaiah 30, 15. They say, no, no, we're going to flee on horses. I can just imagine their nervous systems are so out of whack. They can't even calm down and receive what he's saying to them. And the next verse, after the people are fleeing and they're running away, says, well, the Lord, he longs to be gracious to you. He's waiting for you. And quietness and trust is your strength. See, biblical strength is the exact antithesis of what the world says. The world would say strength is found in your independence. And the Lord says strength's actually precisely defined by your level of dependence. The second reason we put on the armor of God is so that we can stand. So that we can stand. You noticed together, I know you did, how many times men Paul mentioned the word stand in this passage. Clearly, he wants us to get it. This is the aim and the point of putting on our armor. He says, uh, I want you to put it on that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Take up the whole armor that you may be able to withstand. And having done all, stand firm. Stand therefore, having, having fastened the belt of truth. And, and on and on he goes. And is that an interesting aim? In a warfare scenario? 
I mean, you'd kind of expect Paul to say, put on your armor and fight. Put on your armor and fight. And it's not what he says. It's just so curious. He says, stand. I, I really hope for us in the midst of this series and just awakenings in general, that we come to love the scriptures and we read them in such a way that's not us centered. And what I mean by that is we're not going to the text saying, what does this say about me? But we go to the text and we say, what does this say about God? What, what do I see about him in here? What is his heart for me? Let me learn about his character. And I believe when we do that, when we read the word of God that way, that you come to passages like this, just a, a short little piece of a New Testament epistle and you say, you know what, that sounds familiar. This stand business, this sounds like the God I've heard about in some pages before this. I hope that we might get to the point where we see the scriptures as one big biblical narrative. And when you do and you read something like this, you might think, you know what, that kind of reminds me of the Red Sea. Remember when the people, they just left slavery in Egypt? They're on their way out, and they come to a terrible, terrible obstacle. It's a raging big sea. And even worse than that, they turn around and look behind them, and here comes Pharaoh with his mighty army. And they say, oh, Moses, we told you. We told you to leave us alone. We didn't even want to come out here. Just let us be. We certainly would have been better serving the Egyptians than dying in the desert. Why did you do this? In Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 and 14, Moses says, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you only have to be silent. He said, you, you just wait for it. You're getting ready to see some supernatural power. Or maybe you read Ephesians 6 and you think, you know, that sounds a little bit like kind of toward the beginning of Deuteronomy when the people are now about to enter the promised land and Moses is in his last days and they're scared stiff. They've heard about the big people in the land and they're so tempted to go by what they see with their natural eye rather than walk forward in faith with the promises that God had given them over and over again. And Moses says to the people, do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you. Or maybe we would say, that sounds a little bit like, like King Jehoshaphat. Back in 2 Chronicles 20, there were three enemies who banded together to attack God's people. And King Jehoshaphat, he's, he's afraid. And he comes to God honestly with that fear. And he says, for we are powerless against this great horde that's coming against us. We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. And they fasted. And they prayed, and the Spirit of God comes upon a prophet. And the prophet tells the people, do not be afraid, and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not need to fight this battle. Stand firm. 
hold your position and see the salvation of the Lord. So they put the worship leaders in front. They just put them right out front. And they lead the people in, <clears throat> praising God for what they haven't yet seen, but believe will happen. And the enemies destroy one another. It is, there were so many enemies that died and God is just so ridiculously good to his people that after they were all dead, it took the Israelites three days to gather all the spoil of war they got to take home. Three days. I hope that when we read the scriptures like this, this little section of an epistle, that we wouldn't primarily come to it and start to think about ourselves, but we would think, this is just like God. This is just like him. I've heard about this before. I see him. I see him again. This is just who he is. This is how he works. He's a God who fights on behalf of his people. He always has, and he always will. Just this morning, I heard a new song <clears throat> by Mac Brock, and the song is, cut, is called, Just Like You've Always Done. And I wanted to um, read you some of the lyrics. He says, no wonder they call you the ancient of days, alpha, omega, forever the same, the lifter of burdens, breaker of chains, Jesus Messiah, you never change. You're still miracle working. You're still building our faith. You're still giving us reasons to give you all our praise. You're still moving in power. You're still pouring out love. You're still fighting our battles, just like you've always done. Just like you've always done. So we put on our armor and <clears throat> we do it because strength is received. It's not mustered up. We put on the armor to stand because we don't have to fight. We have a God who fights our battles. And the third reason that we put on the armor is because a supernatural battle calls for divine resources. Divine resources. A couple of summers ago, our VBS here at Rinalda had a theme of the armor of God. And I, our, our uh, church, Rinalda Church, has four campuses. One of them is in Kernersville. I'm married to our Kernersville campus pastor, uh, Barrett. And he is all in on VBS when it comes time. And I'm, you know, I'm glad I'm here for it. Um, but he, I didn't know how in he was going to be on this particular year. And so I was just like a little taken aback when I got to the church. And this is what he looks like. <laughs> and just to show you how ridiculous this was, if you could go to the next picture, you gotta look closely. Look at his legs. <laughs> My man wore shorts with a knight's costume. It is ridiculous. <laughs> and he's got his sword there. The kids loved it. The kids absolutely loved it. But so often you hear this armor of God taught with a picture of a Roman soldier, maybe on a felt board for those of us who can remember felt boards. <laughs> and a statement about how Paul said this to the people because he was drawing parallels to the Roman soldiers of the day and what they would have looked like. And it's so easy for this kind of teaching to land in an application, something like, I want to do better putting on my armor. I want to do better putting on my armor. And so when I wake up in the morning, this is going to be one of my strategies for success in my Christian life. I'm going to put on my armor. Paul's saying something so much more rich here so much more rich. I'm sure that Roman soldiers did look like this, but that's not what Paul is saying. The point is not the specifics of an outfit, but rather he's mirroring how the scriptures talk about our warrior king. Amen. That is what Paul is talking to. He's saying, put on the full armor of God. These things were 
God's armor, not just because it has to do with him, but because the prophet Isaiah describes the Lord in these terms as he has done cosmic battle on behalf of his people. Listen to this. Isaiah chapter 11. The Messiah who's coming to people who are suffering. Isaiah says he's full of the spirit and righteousness and faithfulness are his belt. Isaiah 52. God's people absolutely burst out in song because the Lord is coming with beautiful feet to bring good news and to announce peace. Isaiah 59. The Savior faces evil with a breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation to deliver his people. Isaiah 49. The Messiah, speak word, the Messiah speaks words like a sharp sword that brings salvation to the very ends of the earth. The armor of God cor corresponds to how the scriptures describe God himself. And therefore, every piece of the armor, their gifts provided to us in our connection to his person, and they're available in his presence. Do you see it? They're available to us in him. And listen to this. I just love this so much. Each part, they're also perfect antidotes to the schemes of the enemy. Let's think about it together for just a minute. Paul says, put on the belt of truth. Jesus proclaimed real clearly, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And when we put on that belt of truth, it protects us from the deceiver. Yes. Yes. The breastplate, Jesus Christ. If you are in him today, he is your righteousness. He has taken your sin in exchange and given you his merit and righteousness. And that is the piece of the armor that we take up to defeat the evil one who disguises himself as an angel of light, but he is unrighteous. Shoes fitted with the gospel of peace. Jesus himself is our peace. I was thinking this week about the first beautiful angelic announcement of the Messiah's coming. This army and choir of angels appears to the shepherds and say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Peace is finally here and it's gonna be upon those with whom he's well pleased. And we are able to come against the enemy who torments who torments because we have shoes that are fitted with the gospel of peace. We have our shield, God himself. The psalmist tells us over and over again, he's our hiding place for all generations. He is our shield. He is our fortress. He is our defender. And we are protected from the one who seeks to tempt us and Peter's clear, he's not only looking to tempt you, he's looking to devour you. The helmet of salvation. We have been given the mind of Christ. We have been given the mind of Christ and that helmet protects you against the accuser of the brethren. And lastly, the sword the word he's given us, the living and active word of God is the supernatural power we're given to combat the father of lies himself. Paul says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Y'all, we got to keep that in mind this fall. Can we? Come November 5th, we are not, let's, let's quit it. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. 
but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This isn't a fleshly battle. So willpower and human effort will not do. You have to have supernatural resources. You need divine resources for this battle. And God offers you himself. He gives you himself. I love the way Pastor Garrett Kell, he wrote a really helpful article about this passage. And he said this. He said, too often spiritual warfare is seen as an individual believer's call to put on armor and fight demonic forces alone. As if this is a test to prove his faith. I'm going to put on my armor. This couldn't be further from the truth. He says, spiritual warfare is about God's people joining their Lord, their victor, in his warfare. He equips and empowers us to accompany him into enemy territory and further his kingdom purposes. You have a God who fights for you. You absolutely do. God is strong. And he wants you strong. God is strong. And he wants you strong. I just, I wonder if when Paul was finishing this wonderful letter to the church at Ephesus, and he gets to this part, and he's describing the armor of God to them, if it wasn't an application of sorts for him, of this beautiful, rich, pastoral prayer that he'd prayed at the beginning of this book, where in it he says this, this is Ephesians 1.19, I pray that you would know the immeasurably great power toward us who believe. I pray that you would know it He wants us to know that strength does not come from within, but strength is rather received. And he longed for the church to have the actual experience of being upheld, empowered by God to stand in the midst of spiritual attack as he fights for them. And I can imagine he was almost giddy as he wrote about this armor business, thinking, you are going to be blown away. You are going to be blown away. I'm talking about supernatural power that the heavenly one is providing to you for your daily living. I want you to know the immeasurably great power toward us who believe. And then he goes on to say, (laughs) I don't know how else to to describe it other than to tell you, it's the same power that raised him from the dead. That's what we're talking about. And that's what's available to you today. Let me pray for us. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you that when we were stuck in transgressions and sins, that when justice and righteousness were nowhere to be found, that your own arm brought salvation. Father, we worship you. We thank you that you put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on your head and garments of vengeance for clothing and you wrapped yourself in zeal as a cloak and you brought wrath to your enemies and redemption to us. You are the God who fights for us. So God, would you give us grace to be still? Would you give us grace to wait, to arm ourselves, to clothe ourselves with you and stand in faith? We thank you that in the kingdom, we are strong women whose dependence is welcomed and applauded and invited. Thank you, God. 
Thank you that we can come in all of our weakness and our mess and receive strength. Father, equip us for all that you have called us to in this day and in this life. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen.